where we have recorded the gospel according to St. Matthew in the 11th chapter, 969. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in kings' houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and, if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. The Gospel of our Lord. <clears throat> Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Please be seated. Dear friends and family in Christ, may God's grace, his mercy, and his peace be to you from the one who is, who was, and who is to come, our Savior, Jesus, who is Christ. Amen. Amen. We continue in our series of being captivated, and today it's captivated by joy. Captivated by joy. In, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus began his ministry in Galilee. He called the first disciples, he ministered to crowds, but Matthew describes these only briefly. The Sermon on the Mount really introduces Jesus' ministry and outlines his teaching in detail. Miracles con constitute the next significant block of material, and these two large blocks of material, uh, the Sermon and the Miracle, Set the stage for verse 4 in our gospel lesson, in which Jesus tells John's disciples to tell him the things which you hear and the things which you see. For you see, they have heard the Sermon on the Mount. What they have seen are miracles. And so our gospel lesson today in chapter 11, verses 2 through 11, emphasizes the healing the saving, and the empowering ministry of Jesus, which has, well, it was a surprise to those expecting a fiery, judgmental Messiah. However, this chapter then shifts to a judgmental tone, including the woes of verses 20 through 24. But then that chapter ends with, uh, on a soft note, where Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavily burdened, and I will give you rest. In this gospel especially, Jesus comforts the afflicted and afflicts the comfortable. <laughs> when John heard in prison the works of Christ, Christ, the anointed one, Messiah is a transliteration of the Hebrew word for anointed, and Christ is a transliteration of the Greek word for anointed. 
So you can see there's a consistency. In the Old Testament, kings and princes, excuse me, kings and priests were anointed or set apart for their respective duties. The Jewish people look forward to the coming of the Messiah, hmm? mm -hmm. the anointed one who would bring salvation. But they thought Messiah as a great king like David, a warrior who would restore Israel to its former glory. John's question in verse 3 is very much occasioned in part by this understanding of the Messiah. You see, John was preparing the way for what he thought was going to be the traditional idea of Messiah, a warrior king. Well, Matthew mentioned John's arrest in uh, chapter 4, verse 12, but he didn't offer an explanation why that happened. But in chapter 14, he goes into more detail. He tells us that sordid story of heritage marriage to his brother's wife and John's criticism of Herod, and after that, his arrest. And the daughter's dance that leads to John's beheading. The historian Josephus tells us that John is imprisoned um, at one of Herod's desert fortresses east of the Dead Sea. But we hear once again that John sent two of his disciples. Now, a literal translation of that is having sent by way of his disciples. He's inquiring. They're going to be asking on his behalf. So John is imprisoned. He can't go on his own. So he sends these disciples. Uh, Matthew doesn't tell us how John gets word to his disciples, but apparently some of them have been permitted to visit him in his prison cell. Beside all that, uh, the question is, remember, we need to reiterate that. Are you he who comes, or should we look for another? Maybe we're surprised at, that uh, John would ask such a question. But we've already heard a little bit of what John uh, was expecting. Luke tells us that even before John and Jesus were born, Mary visited Elizabeth. John's mother. We hear it happened when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting that the baby, John, leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. She called out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Lord. Matthew tells us that John preached, make, way the, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight, and then when Jesus presented himself to John for baptism, John protested. Remember that? I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me? And after the baptism, we are told the heavens opened, the Spirit of God descended like a dove, and a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. How can John question whether Jesus is the one who is to come when he himself saw all that. Well, the reason behind John's question is found in those messianic uh, expectations. He called people to repent because even now, as he said, the axe lies at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't bring forth good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. He warned that the one who was to come would baptize with the Holy Spirit in fire. He said that his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly cleanse his threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn up with unquenchable fire. So you see, John really <laughs> expected his cousin Jesus to be the kind of fire and brimstone uh, Messiah. But there's a problem. Jesus wasn't living up to what John was expecting. Jesus pronounced blessings on the poor in spirit, the meek, the peacemakers. He has called his disciples to love their enemies. He has warned them not to judge others. And these teachings, compared to what John was expecting, seem pretty weak. But those actions that were anticipated because John was saying uh, there would be fire and brimstone in, in his preaching. <laughs> Furthermore, 
Jesus moved away from Jerusalem, the home of the temple and the center of those religious uh, authorities, and began his ministry in Galilee. Then Jesus worked a series of healing ministries. We find that in chapters 8 and 9. And those are of very, very high significance to those who were healed, but not so much to the nation as a whole. You see, Jesus did that mostly in Galilee. But it has been centuries since Israel has heard a prophetic voice. 400 years. People are looking for a voice of authority, for a fire that will purge the dross, for a powerful leader who will restore Israel's former glory, for a Messiah who will restore the people of God. And John, like, uh, uh, well, he keeps watching Jesus, hoping uh, to see fireworks. Do you get that? Yeah, Jesus, John was expecting some fireworks. He expected condemnation. He expected judgment. He expected things to be set in order, kind of like Jonah. Huh? Didn't want to go to Nineveh, but when he had to, he spoke a short, simple, uh, and yet so many days Nineveh will be overthrown. Then he went up on a hill to watch the fireworks. But it didn't happen because God had compassion on those people. And we see here that John had been mistaken about how Messiah was going to be, and he was expecting all kinds of reports that Jesus had cleaned things up. What might we say today? Clear the swamp. Drain the swamp. But John's disappointed. Well, don't we have kind of the same problems today? Hmm? We, we see the church shuffling along, preaching mostly to the converted, sending a few dollars to disaster victims, shepherding a family through its grief, and teaching Bible stories to children. Outwardly, it doesn't look like much, does it? Shouldn't the church be shaking the foundations we hear the church militant? Well, there are some things about that that are very true. Well, shouldn't it uh, be more like an urban renewal developer that is tearing down and rebuilding and less like a handyman that's patching leaks? John's imprisonment raises a further question. If God chose John to prepare the way for the one who is to come, then what on earth is John doing in prison? If Jesus is the one who is to come, why doesn't he bring down fire from heaven on John's oppressors? Why doesn't an earthquake open the prison doors, as will happen later for Paul and Silas? Why does God allow God's prophet to sit through long, empty days in prison? We have those same kinds of questions today, don't we? Why does God allow the righteous to suffer? Why doesn't God answer our prayers for healing? If we tithe, why doesn't God reward us with riches? If we attend church regularly, why doesn't God find us a job or a spouse or whatever it is that we feel that we desperately need at that particular time? Right now. But on the other hand, we must admire John. You see, he has a problem with Jesus. So he approaches Jesus as directly as his imprisonment will allow. No behind-the-back criticism. He sends his disciples to ask Jesus if he is the one or shall they look for another. So John is an honest doubter. Do we have those among us today? He seeks to learn what Jesus will say. He is open to hearing Jesus say that he is indeed the one. But Jesus tells him through those disciples, go and tell John the things that you hear and see. What are the things that you hear and see today about Jesus? Well, we go to our main source. It's in the Holy Scriptures, is it not? And we hear the testimony of all those folks who have gone before us in uh, continuing to tell the story so that we don't lose it. That's why we have the Bible. That's why we have the Gospels, especially so that we don't forget. 
We remember what Jesus has done and continues to do among us. There are still instances where the blind are receiving their sight, the lame are walking, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. We heard in the praise of our prayers today, did we not? That here is one person who is learning to, uh, learning to walk as he recovers from that horrible accident. That in itself is a miracle, especially when the, uh, uh, the physicians would say, you're done. You're done. You're not going to walk again. You're, you're going to be bedridden or you're going to be in a wheelchair for the rest of your life. You see, some of those things, the miraculous still takes place. And in other cases, there is a miracle that happens when the prayers are not answered for healing. And God, through his Holy Spirit, touches them and says, you're not finished. You still can do things even if you are stuck in a bed or stuck in a wheelchair or what, whatever it might be. You still have the power of God through his Holy Spirit. You can still share the good news. You can still pray for others as well as you pray for yourself that you will have courage to keep on keeping on. Yes. It's what, you know, it's what John the Baptist was talking about, is it not? He says you need to come to repentance so that you know the power of the Lord. And then Jesus comes in his very, very calm, loving, meek way, and he says, you listen to me, you do what I do, and you're going to experience that inner healing, and you'll be given a wisdom and an understanding so that when things don't go exactly the way you expected Jesus to work, you still are praising him because he is working in ways that we don't recognize. You may be seeing that in folks that are around you right now. People will say, well, I don't have any skills. I can't do anything anymore. Look what's happened to me in my life. But Jesus will say that's, that's foolishness to think that way. Because what I have done is I have provided a way for you to continue to be an effective tool for me. So, you know, so often... You find yourself catching yourself or somebody else and saying, boy, I wish that, you know, God would get busy and come down here, that Jesus would come so all these folks would get what they, ex what they deserve. Huh? You ever found yourself saying that or agreeing with somebody that said it? <laughs> what, is, what does Jesus say? What does God say? Vengeance is mine. I will repay. Yeah. Jesus says, judge not lest you be judged. Leave that up to me. What are we supposed to do? To love the unlovable, not just those that you like or agree with. Jesus, because of John, is saying, John wasn't totally mistaken, because Jesus does come with a power, but a power that is totally different than was expected. Jesus is still King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus is still the one who works miracles, giving uh, sight to the blind, giving hearing to the deaf, giving a voice to those who are mute. And you know what? Sometimes we see folks, well, some of you have had strokes, and it was a struggle to begin to learn how to speak again, was it not? And sometimes uh, we'll get the, the bad news of saying, you may as well just uh, uh, face the reality, you're not going to be able to speak anymore. But then, through God's intervention, with the prayers of the people, with the encouragement, and the bound and determined uh, trusting in God to keep moving, to keep trying, to keep uh, trying to improve, there are some breakthroughs. Yes. And it may not be the way that we expect to be able to communicate again, but there is communication. You know, some folks, when they are uh, somehow uh, stricken with not being able to speak, they can still see they learn sign language. And then they're able to communicate in different ways, aren't they? Think about that. When we think that Jesus should cater to our every whim, that he should answer our prayers in exactly the way that we expect it. You see, John the Baptist was expecting Jesus to send back a report that, no, I'm just getting ready to go and beat on some Romans' heads. I'm going to clear everything out, and I'm going to establish the kingdom, and by golly, John, I'm going to get you out of prison, you're going to be my right-hand man. 
He could have been expecting that. But Jesus didn't work that way. There was a better plan. And it is a plan is when Jesus was lifted up on the cross. When he forgave our sins. Just as he forgave that, that other criminal that was uh, crucified right beside him. You see? Jesus says, I'll take care of things. John, I'll take care of things. Just as I'm starting to take care of things. So listen to what your disciples are going to re report to you. What you've seen. What you hear. For us. Report what you see. Jesus working in us. And what you hear. The good news is still preached to the poor. Yes. And many of us, if not all of us, are poor in spirit. We are struggling in our faith. We are hurting. We feel like we're abandoned. We feel like there's no hope. But Jesus says, oh, but you're so mistaken. There is hope. Because I have come that you may have life and you may have it abundantly. And as we continue and we say that we are captivated by joy, if that's not joy, I don't know what it is, to know that Jesus Christ is working for us, in us, through us, so that others might be brought to him. Think about that. Joy. Are we captivated by that joy? Are we, expect, or are we expecting Jesus to be a you know, rough, tough uh, cage fighter? No, he's not. He still continues to be the one who loves, who invites us into relationship with him, who says, you let me handle things. Observe what I do through you and observe and hear what I tell you because it's all right there. It's in the scripture and it's in the people that God sends into your life to encourage you to bring you good news when you're poor in spirit when you're hurting, when you feel hopeless. That's his promise. May that be joy that captivates you from now and on. Amen.